is seen through the Gospel of Matthew. And we're in chapter 5 right now. Um, three continuous chapters, chapters 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, is just Jesus' is teaching. Just, there's, there's not a non-red letter in the whole chapters. You know, it's just, it, it's, it's the longest continual um, teaching of Jesus found in, in Scripture. And so we're going to be looking at a, a very challenging passage of Scripture today. It may be, I don't know that there's, there's another passage in Scripture that's any more um, difficult to, to really... We, we, we've all wrestled uh, with, with Jesus' words in, in John, I mean, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 through 20. So I want us to take a look at that this week. And so if you want to turn to Matthew 5 and verse 17, let's read the passage. Now, I want us to just recall that uh, Jesus, last week we looked at the Beatitudes. And Jesus kind of leads his teaching from that place. And Jesus describes an upside down kingdom. It's this, this kingdom that doesn't look like anything that would be familiar to us from a kingdom of this world. It, it's a heavenly kingdom. And... Um, I like to think of it as a right-side-up kingdom. <laughs> it's, it's the earth that got it all backwards. You know, we, we look at life and from, a, from really an upside-down way, but if Jesus is teaching us about his kingdom. And so we come to verse 17 of chapter 5, and Jesus makes this declaration. And he says to them, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's really, um, that's quite a lot to chew on. Now, it's been disputed for 2,000 years. People have been wrestling over this. What did Jesus exactly mean by that? And and what does that mean for for how we live life? Especially as believers in, in, in Christ, new covenant believers, what does this mean to us? When Jesus says not one iota, not one dot is going to pass from the law until all is, is completed, until all is accomplished, um, what does that mean to us in, in practical terms, in, in, in how we live our lives? Does that mean that we, we need to keep all 613 laws contained in the Torah, that, that first five books of, of Scripture? Does is, is that what it implies, you know? And, and when you begin to look at the, the 613 laws, and you know, I would encourage you to, to go look and read. I mean, um, but it would, it would look, our lives would look very, very different than they do currently today. You know, not being able to mix uh, clothing types, cotton and wool mixes, you know, you, you couldn't do that. Um, when you take a look at, you're required to wear a tassel. None of us are wearing tassels. Um, there, there's the commandment not to, to boil um, the, the mother with her milk, you know, the meat with the cheese, the meat with the, 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 the milk, that is. And so, you know, even things like having a cheeseburger um, would, would not be permissible because that they might be the, the milk of the mother. Um, I mean, we just go on, 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 on. You, you, you couldn't wear the same clothes as a woman, a woman, a man. So someone's going to have to give up wearing pants, you know. Um, uh, I'm hoping it's the women. But <laughs> kilts just don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, and things like our, our tattoos, a uh, sin. Uh, you know, and it, and it just goes on and on and on. So, you know, how then are we to view Jesus' words and how are we to allow them to shape the way we do life? That's, that's the ultimate question. 
Well, I, I think it's important for us to look at the context of what Jesus is saying here. And we need, we need to understand uh, that Jesus is not speaking into a vacuum. There are, there, there's been accusations. There's been um, charges leveled against Jesus. And, and those charges you can imply from the context of Jesus' first words. Um, people are saying that, hey, th- this, this rabbi, this teacher... He's saying that um, he's abolishing the law. He's abolishing the prophets. He's abolishing Moses. You're tearing down everything that Moses established. And the question is, just who do you think you are? By what authority can you do these things? You, how, you can't do that. Well, in, in Mark chapter 1, he makes this um, observation about Jesus and the people observing Jesus. And it says that they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. He he, he spoke with a a lot of authority and he he taught in that that way. If if you read the the passage in its entirety in in Matthew chapter 5, you'll realize that after this, this passage that we just read, that six different times Jesus says, you have heard it said. You've heard it said. And then he quotes from, from the Torah, something that the Torah taught. And then he turns around and says, but I say, and then he, he gives his teaching, which is an expansion. I mean, sometimes an astonishing expansion of what Moses taught. And so you, you get this, in a sense, six different times, Jesus says, Moses has written, but I say. Moses has said, but I say. You know, this, this back, I mean, that's authority. And that, and that definitely is not how the scribes or the Pharisees would, would teach Scripture. And so we can understand why there is angst among the religious leaders. They're, they're, they're saying, you're teaching this kingdom, this new kingdom of God that's come. What does that mean in terms of the kingdom that we received through Moses that was realized by Joshua going into the promised land. We already have a kingdom, Jesus. I, I, and you're talking about this kingdom come, this new kingdom. Well, what does that do to the kingdom that we were given? Um, what does it mean for the structures of law and authority that we have? What does it mean for the priesthood? What does it mean for where we worship, how we worship? All these things are coming into question now and and there's tension they're 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 nervous about where jesus is going with all this and so he makes that statement in verse 17 and he tells them he says which is at at first probably seemed a comforting statement (laughs) we're gonna kind of unpack it but he tells them do not think that i have come to abolish the law or the prophets I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So there's a couple of words here that I, I want to, to bring out and, and to understand a little more fully. That word abolish in the Greek is kataluo, and it means to destroy. It means to tear down. It means to, you know, to make a null, to make as nothing. Um, so do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. So the second word is plerao, that's that word fulfill, and it means to complete. It it means to bring to its fullest place of meaning or understanding or expression. And so um, the word English is actually, in English, is actually a a pretty good translation. You know, fulfill means to bring um, something to its fullness, to fill, to full. Um, And so... Jesus says, I've come to fulfill them, to bring it to a, a place of, of completeness, to, to complete fullness. <clears throat> One more um, term that he uses here that I, I think it's worth taking a look at and, and understanding. Law and prophets. Law and prophets. So this is an idiom, and I don't know if you've... Um, an idiom is something that in a in any language, we've got them all over. Um, but it means that we, we, it means more than the words would imply. And, and let me give you an example. If I say, I've got to go to the bathroom, uh, or the restroom would be even, even better. I have to go to the restroom. 
You all know what I'm, what I'm saying. But, you know, 2,000 years, if you were to, in the future, if you were to go back and take a look at, I'm going to the rest. Oh, you're going to the bedroom for a nap. Or, or you're going to the, your bedroom to, for the, your night's sleep. Ah, okay, that's... See, but, but it doesn't mean that at all. It means much more. The context, the idiom, is, is much more than that. And so when Jesus says, you know, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, this word law and prophets is, is it's scripture. It's the entirety of the, what we would call the Old Testament. So the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and everything else that came after, the prophets. And so let me give you an example of that. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 15, and there's examples of this actually all over in the, in the New Testament. But in Acts chapter 13 and verse 15, Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey. And they're in Antioch of Pisidia in modern day Turkey. And, and they begin to preach in the synagogue on, on a Sabbath. And it says this, after reading from the law and the prophets, that's the scripture, so the, 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 the scrolls. After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So, I want, so when, when Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, what he's saying is, is far greater than just what we usually think of, I've not come to abolish the law, meaning the 613. But actually he starts out with a very broad statement. I've not come to destroy Scripture at all, the entirety of Scripture. I've not come to, to null it. I've not come to destroy it. Now, he kind of continues to look at verse 18 in, in Matthew 5. Jesus says, For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, this is largely uh, what we would consider an emphatic restatement of what he just said. Uh, Jesus is kind of the way I would... Let, let me say that again, in case you missed it. He says, I tell you, heaven and earth, heaven and earth will not pass away. Not an iota, not a dot is going to pass away until all is, is accomplished. And so, th- again, there's, there's a couple of uh, words here that we, we need to look at. The first is this iota. Um, jot is, I think, how the King James translates it. An iota in the Greek is the smallest of letters. Um, it looks like a, an I to us with a dot on top of it. Now, Jesus wasn't teaching, I don't think, in, in Greek. Uh, the translation of the smallest Hebrew letter would have been yod. And so it's just a, a tiny little little... In fact, I think I have a, a slide here uh, that kind of shows it's the leftmost little little squiggle line, that kind of curvature. That's a yod, and that's actually the end of the word because Hebrew reads from right to left. That's Sarah. Uh, that's the the name Sarah, Sarai. Excuse me, Sarai. And so, um, give you kind of an example. Um, so, already by the time of Jesus there was a very, um, they honored scripture. They loved scripture. They believed that scripture was from God, that it was authoritative, and, and, and they held it in high, high esteem. Now, they had a saying, this is, this is really quite intriguing to me, and so Jesus isn't teaching from a vacuum here is what I'm, I'm trying to go from. Is that, so they had this saying that every single yod must be preserved, that God... Um, honors and, and, and cherishes each and every yod of his word, smallest little squiggle. And so when, when Sarai was renamed Sarah, the yod was taken off. And so then they would say, they said, but God replaced the yod, brought it back into scripture because Hoshea, who is, we know as Joshua, God added that yod back to Joshua's name. He became Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus. Um, and so it's interesting that this, I'm not saying that has a huge significance, I'm just saying this is how they thought. So this would have been the, the common teaching. And so Jesus says, 
I'm, I'm telling you the truth that heaven and earth will not pass away, not a single yod. And then he, he one-ups them. He says, in fact, I'll tell you something, not even a dot, not even just a, a, a pin touching the papyrus, not even that is going to disappear from the law until all is accomplished. He's, he's, and it's an emphatic statement. That's not at all why I came. Now, this surety, this, this heaven and earth is not going to pass away. What, what Jesus is teaching is that, again, he, he's tying it to, you know, the way we think of as sure as the sun will come up tomorrow. You know, that all is going to be accomplished. All is going to be fulfilled. You can, you can go to the bank with that statement, Jesus is saying. It's easier for heaven and earth to disappear, for the sun not to rise tomorrow morning, than for the smallest of letter from a dot not to be fulfilled. That, that's what the emphatic statement Jesus is making. He, he continues in verse 19, and he tells them that, therefore, whoever relaxes. Now, Jesus is making a play on words here again, because the word there in the Greek is luo, which is the same word as kataluo, abolish. He's saying what Jesus is saying, I, unless, um, excuse me, um, whoever destroys, whoever annuls, whoever unties, even the smallest of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's a very strong statement. I, I want you to just um, reflect on it, the, the strength of that statement. Now, Jesus, in Luke chapter 7, speaking in, in the same context, Luke records it this way. He says, I tell you, this is Luke chapter 7, verse 28. He says, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is at least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. He who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Now Jesus says anyone that relaxes one of the, these commandments is going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know the full, but those jive together somehow. You know, there, there's, there's significance there in how Jesus is viewing his statement in, there in verse 19. But the, the stunner, the one that just kind of, the, the, the jaw dropper is actually verse 20 where Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Dan and I walked, uh, I don't know, was it Monday, Tuesday, something, yeah, early this week. And uh, so we were talking about this passage a little bit. He asked me a question that I thought was really insightful. And uh, he asked me, if you'd have been sitting in the audience... If you'd have been sitting on that mountaintop, you know, that kind of, and you'd been listening to Jesus, what have been, would have been your reaction to what Jesus just said here, where Jesus tells you, you know, um, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not going to see it. And I, I, I had to think about that a little bit, but, but you know what? I, I would be demoralized. I'd be discouraged, depressed. I would be thinking about just, it's time to pack it up and go home and just resign myself that the kingdom of heaven I will never see. That Hades is going to be my, my ultimate place. Uh, you know, you have to understand that the Pharisees were the epitome, I mean the pinnacle of human righteousness. No one out righteous outwork the law of Pharisees. In all of human history, no one has done man-made righteousness better than the Pharisees. Now, Pharisees, they did not become. Pharisees were born. They were born into a family who from day one just um, ingrained the law into them. By the time that they were even a teenager, many of them would have memorized the entire Torah, the first five books of the Bible. They could recite it from memory. The ones that were especially gifted, that seemed to be especially 
in tune to, to Torah, would, be, would go off to be discipled by a rabbi. And at, at maturity, then they would take on, they would become a Pharisee. They would become a scribe, a teacher of the law. And so when Jesus makes that statement, the ordinary people in the audience, their jaws drop. And they say, I can't do it. I can't, my righteousness can't even, I, I can't even come to um, equal one of these Pharisees in the, what they do, let alone exceed that. Now, 27 verses later, Jesus actually, he doesn't stop his, his line of thought. He, he, he continues when he, when, he, when he says, you have heard it said, but I say, you have heard it said, but I say, He's continuing on the same, and he's expanding it. He's saying, you have heard the Pharisees teach from Moses this. Then he says, but I say, you know, he says, you know, you have heard it said not to commit adultery. He says, but if you even look at a woman in a lustful way, this is going, you know, you've committed adultery already. He says, you have heard it said that you shall not commit murder. But I tell you that if you are even angry with a brother or, or sister, you know, if you're angry with someone else, you've already committed the, the sin of murder. He's just like uh, talking about exceeding the Pharisees. He, he's going so far and beyond. And then he caps all that, those six de- declarations with these words. And this would just put the, the nail in the coffin for me. Verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Do you know how perfect God is? Think about it. And Jesus just said, you've got to be perfect, just as perfect as God is. Any last grain of hope in, inside of you would have just would have melted. It would have gone. It's like, I can't do that. I, that's Jesus' point, you understand. That's where Jesus is driving this whole discussion. That's where he's going with this whole thing. Is Do you realize your perilous place? You can't get to the kingdom of heaven that I'm telling you about in your own merit, in your own righteousness. You cannot go there. You can't make it. It's an impossibility. Now, Paul... In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6, he's talking about himself as a, as a Pharisee, his former life. And he tells them that I was zealous. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. But then he makes this statement in, in verse 6 of Philippians chapter 3. And he says that as to righteousness under the law, blameless, faultless. I did it to, you know, that's what he's saying. I did it to perfection. But then how do we reconcile what Paul shares in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15? Where he says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am foremost. I am the greatest sinner. I am chief among sinners. Nobody was a worse sinner than I was. So how do you reconcile those two statements? How can you be, according to the law, blameless? But he says, but I was the chiefest of sinners. Our thinking, we're ingrained to think through man-made eyes. Our righteousness is by our doing. And we cannot reconcile those two statements together. If you're blameless according to the law, then you're righteous. And so then you aren't the chiefest of sinners. I want to suggest to you that that Paul isn't misstating either of those statements. He was both. And that's the whole problem with the law, is you can be blameless according to that law and just be as damned as damned can be, right? Going to hell. The chiefest of sinners. The worst among the worst. That's the, that's the illusion of the law. That's the deceitful nature of it. It's that it makes you think that you're, you're something that you're absolutely not. That, that, that's, that's the whole quandary. And, and Jesus is is really exposing all that. And he says to them, unless you're perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, the kingdom of heaven will never be yours. You must be that. 
You must be that. Well, in Romans chapter 7, Paul shares this, this, this really this beautiful thought. In chapter 7 in verse 24, describing himself, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to deliver me from this place that I am, this chiefest of sinners? This is, this is he's, he's recognizing who he is. He's looking at himself clearly in the mirror, and then he makes this extraordinary, you know, just a beautiful statement here. He says, thanks be to God, who through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's, Jesus is the one that is going to, to, to remove this, this awful, wretched, sinful state that I find myself in. And so it is when, when Jesus says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, um, it's not a hopeless situation. It's not hopeless at all. In fact, I would have hoped that if I would have been that, that day in the crowd, that I would reflect on the love that was in Jesus' eyes the hope that was there. Even as he's saying those words, and even though as I'm listening, my heart is sinking, I'm looking into his eyes and they're saying, I love you, I love you, you're mine, you're precious. And, 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 and you can see that took effect, that the, the sinners, the, the broken, the, the prostitutes, all the people that were most broken, that they saw that in his eyes and they came and they received Jesus. And Jesus loved them and they loved him in return. So I want us to go back. I want to go back to verse 17, kind of where we began. And I want to reread that passage through the eyes of Jesus' redemptive work for us on the cross. Beginning with verse 17, where Jesus says, tell them, he said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now that's, that's a very key phrase right there. Now, Matthew is, is really interesting. This is, this is one of those pivotal verses in terms of understanding and following Matthew's gospel. Let me, let me um, illustrate that. So beginning in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22, Jesus says that all must be fulfilled, right? But to, I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. Well, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22, Matthew writes, all this took place to fulfill the, what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Fulfill. Go down, drop down a few verses to verse 15. Um, chapter 2, verse 15. And they remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son, Hosea. Drop down two verses, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Drop down six verses. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. I don't have time to go through the entire, well, we just went through two Two chapters, the first. It just continues. He fulfilled, he fulfilled, thus he fulfilled, thus he fulfilled, thus he fulfilled. What is Matthew telling us? He fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled it. He did exactly what he, what he told us. He came to fulfill them. Well, continue. Take a look at verse 18 in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus said, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not even a dot is going to pass from the law until all is accomplished. All is until all is completed, brought to that state of completed. As Jesus hung on the cross, as recorded in John chapter 19, it says that the, the soldiers at the feet of the cross, that they were speaking to one another. And this is found in verse 24 of chapter 19. And they say to one another, let us not tear it, his, his garment, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. 
Psalms chapter 22. Drop down four verses. This is really a, a key verse. After Jesus, after this, Jesus, knowing, knowing that all things were now accomplished. Jesus was aware of what was going on. Jesus watched as they cast lots. Another iota, another dot, fulfilled. He was aware. He knew that all things was accomplished. One more, one more iota to dot. And then everything is done. And look what Jesus says. He says, um, this is in verse 28. Knowing that all things were now accomplished, that scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. I thirst. In Psalms chapter 69 and verse 21, it, it records, the, the psalm says, they gave me poison for food. And for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. The last dot. When they gave him on the sponge, remember it was sour wine mixed with gall. Fulfilled. The scripture is fulfilled. In verse 28, John chapter 9, I mean, verse 30 of John 19. So it says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. It's complete. It's done. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He accomplished what he came to do. He accomplished what he came to do. Every yod, every yoda, every dot, fulfilled, checked off, accomplished, accomplished, finished. In Philippians chapter 3, in verse 8, we find another way. A way to righteousness, a path to righteousness. In the audience that day as you listen, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There had to be a way apart from the law. Because you and I are never going to get there by the law. I liken it to the Tower of Babel. You remember that they were going to build a tower that reached God, reached into the heavens. Well, knowing a little bit about the universe and <laughs> the, 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 just the distance to the moon, we, we know that the, just the absurdity of what they were trying to do. I want to, I want to suggest to you that that's more real than, that's more realistic than trying to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect through our own doing, through our own building, through our own efforts, our own righteousness. There has to be another way. There ha if we're going to be in the kingdom of God with eternity, with our, our beloved father, heavenly father, there's got to be another way. We find that in, in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. As Paul shares again about his life, he says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Look at this, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through a faith in Christ. That's it. The righteousness never was intended to come through the law. It was always meant to be realized through a faith in Christ Jesus. It's there that we find our hope. It's in there that we find what Jesus accomplished, that Jesus made a way for us where the law never could, where our, our own strength, our own efforts never could. So in conclusion... Did you know that you can be as perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect? Did you know that you can be as perfect as God? That just sounds almost unbelievable. It's too good to be true. Uh, how, how can this be? Do you realize who you're talking to? Do, do you know who I am? 
Do you realize my imperfection, my sin, my brokenness, all my shame? Do you, do you, do you understand? But that's who Jesus declares you to be. That you can be as perfect as, as my Heavenly Father. Your Father, Heavenly Father, is perfect because I have fulfilled every iota, every dot it has been accomplished, everything has been finished. It is complete. I want you to consider and just bask in the, the significance of that. My, my concern is as magnificent as that is, I believe that most Christians never really fully understand it or embrace it. The, the wonder of our salvation in Christ still manages to escape us at some level. Many, many Christians today are somehow still under this weight of obligation, trying to work to achieve righteousness, trying to measure up, trying to put one more story on that Tower of Babel, right? Or just one more story, and then he, he'll be pleased with me. Then he'll be proud of me, accept me, consider me to be righteous. It's this struggle. You'll never get there. If you're building on that tower, it's, it's just such a, a hopeless, back-breaking, spirit-breaking endeavor. It cannot be. It's failure. My, my own life, I think most of us have spent a lot of work on that tower, right? We know it well. We've been there. We put the bricks in place trying to somehow build a tower that can reach up to heaven, to somehow our righteousness merit God's pleasure, His, His delight in us. We've tried to do it. And, and here's, the, here's really the, the sickness of about it, is that many Christians, and, and I, I know this firsthand, I have faith in Christ enough for salvation but I do not have faith enough in Christ for righteousness. I believe that he saved me, but I think somehow I still have to do that work. I have to build that tower. I got all those iotas and all those dots. Somehow I have to be the one that is somehow accounting for them, fulfilling them, being righteous in my own strength. Paul writes, he became sin, speaking of Jesus, who knew no sin, we might become his righteousness. An amazing statement that in Christ we receive the righteousness of God. Did you know that Jesus is perfect just like his heavenly Father is perfect? And if you have his righteousness, you have the perfection of the Father. It's there. It's ours if we will put our faith in Christ Jesus and in him alone. The magnificence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The incredible beauty of work, Christ's work for us on the cross. God bless. Let, let's pray. No. Oh. Father, Papa, Daddy, we just come. And and we just come because of Christ. We become a, come because of Jesus and his work. Lord, we rest in that completed work. We thank you that we can be perfect just as you are perfect. This has nothing to do with our merit, and I just rejoice in that. It was not possible for us to spend eternity in your presence, but you made a way. You made that way, and I praise you for all eternity. I give you my heart. I give you my life. To you I belong.